Hi there, two minutes to six here in Moscow. You're live with our international live news event. To bring you, let's go straight to Antalya in Turkey. President Putin's giving a news conference at the G20 summit there. Let's listen in. Ensure a return of that money and also in order to put Ukraine in a tight spot, in a tight fix, we've taken an unusual and an unexpected decision. Not only have we offered to restructure that loan, but we actually offered better conditions to Ukraine than uh, requested by by the IMF. We had been requested to postpone payment until next year, and I told uh, that told them that uh, we were prepared to choose a deeper restructuring so that, that this year we would not get paid uh, back at all, and next year get one billion, next year to 2017 to get another billion, and 2018 another billion. But since our counterparts are confident that the Ukrainian government will become will be will be growing more solvent, and uh, they believe they, that there is no reason to doubt that uh, they they'll be even able to pay us back uh, three billion next year. Uh, and in that case, it is no problem to provide safeguards to provide uh, guarantees to us. Um, and we requested such guarantees either from the government uh, of the United States or the EU or some. Uh, one of the um, re renowned international financial institutions. Uh, we hope that this issue will be resolved uh, by December this year due to the specific timetable, uh, 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 the specific schedule of the IMF. Uh, we discussed this issue with Madame Lagarde, and today, uh, in passing, we even discussed it with the U.S. President and the U.S. Treasurer. I can tell you that this proposal was met with interest, with, with interest, and we have agreed with our partners that in the nearest future we would uh, discuss its uh, details. Indeed, if our counterparts believe that Ukraine will become will be growing more solvent, and they're trying to convince uh, us of that, that means they they believe that themselves. Uh, uh, if uh, they believe it themselves, let them provide us guarantees. And if they do not provide us guarantees, that would mean they do not believe in Ukraine's future solvency, and that that would be bad. That would mean that they're trying to convince us uh, of uh, something they uh, don't believe in themselves, uh, and. That, that also would not be a hopeful sign for our Ukrainian counterparts. Uh, but we see no problem with sharing uh, risks with our partners. Uh, the Rosyska Gazeta newspaper, Mr. Putin, it was said a lot about, uh, about uh, Turkey's presidency being consistent with that of Russia uh, with regard to the previous summit in Petersburg. Do you think this uh, um, consistency has been confirmed? Indeed, we've worked closely at the expert level uh, within the framework of G20 uh, to implement our uh, past proposals of St. Petersburg to prevent uh, tax evasion uh, and to prevent uh, a contraction of the taxable base. Uh, in Russia, we developed a whole set of measures and we even adopted a federal law uh, on controlled uh, foreign companies. Um, within the framework of the arrangements we had arrived at uh, in Petersburg, at the expert level, we worked uh, actively with uh, OECD representatives and we have drawn up uh, a road map, uh, an action plan to that end. Uh, and uh, we just uh, mentioned that now we, we are about to start to get down to implementing it. So we do see Turkey's presidency uh, as uh, consistent with ours. The same goes um, for the issue of uh, uh, investment, especially on infrastructure projects. Bloomberg Television. There's been a lot of talk about Parovsky. There's been a lot of talk following the latest events in Paris. Uh, there was speculation that there might be qualitative changes uh, in the relationship between Russia and the West following these recent terrorist attacks. So do you believe in that? And do you see any uh, actual 
uh, evidence of that, uh, judging by your uh, latest meetings with the UK Prime Minister and the US President. Well, you know, we never rejected uh, better relations uh, with any of our partners, be that uh, in the West or in the East. Uh, uh, any action on their part uh, uh, curbing and limiting our uh, collaboration uh, have been initiated by our partners, by our counterparts, uh, not by ourselves. If our partners believe it is time to change uh, our relationship now, we have nothing against that. We never shut our doors uh, on our counterparts. Uh, it did seem to us uh, that at least at the expert level, at the level of deliberating and discussing issues, uh, we are seeing clear interest uh, in resuming uh, collaboration and joint activities on many issues, including the economy, politics, and security. And during last year's meeting of G20, some said that y uh, you were a rogue state, that you were a pariah in the G20, and now you are seen as an equal partner on Syria. What has changed? Uh, uh, do you agree with uh, these assessments? Uh, and what do you think about uh, this uh, turn of tide? Uh, well, of course, last year I already said that our Australian counterparts had provided a very good enabling environment for joint activities. Everything was uh, very correct, uh, but probably uh, there was this uh, temptation to present it to the international community as if Russia was isolated, but this was not the case. And uh, me leaving earlier, ahead of the end of the meeting. Uh, it was a technical decision. I just didn't want to stand in line for departure. Uh, that's why I left earlier. It was a 14 flight to Moscow, so I just had to, to be on the first uh, jet to leave. I know the way protocol services work, uh, scheduling departure from those summits, uh, and I didn't want to wait for 13 hours before I was uh, able to leave. Otherwise, we didn't have any issues either back then or today. Day, even though the relations were more strained one year ago, and uh, now it is it, it's becoming palpable. But of course, life goes on. Uh, new issues and new threats and ch new challenges arise. Uh, and uh, those uh, challenges you cannot, it's difficult to address on your own, whoever you are. You need to join efforts. RIA Novosti News Agency. I would like to go back to the issue of terrorism. Over the past uh, m few months, uh, there's been a series of tragic events all over the world. Uh, explosions uh, in Baghdad, uh, uh, attempted uh, terrorist attacks in, in Istanbul, the crash of the Russian jet, even though there's been no final conclusion, but all experts agree that you can't rule out a terrorist attack. And now these latest uh, uh, harrowing terrorist attacks in Paris. France has launched a massive offensive in Syria. Every leader at any multilateral uh, meeting or any press appearance uh, spoke of the necessity to join forces. Uh, do you think it would be possible to form a, a, a common anti-terrorism coalition? And what would it look like? What, it, what would its parameters, uh, what uh, would it be about? I don't only believe it would be possible. I think it, it is also necessary to form such a coalition. And I spoke of that. Uh, at the 70th uh, session of the UN General Assembly dedicated to, to the to the 70th anniversary since the establishment of the organization. And the following, uh, the most recent tragic events have only proved us right. As for how this coalition should look like, um, it's really nothing complicated. Um, uh, we would need to start some actual joint uh, activities, uh, joint operations, uh, uh, on combating terrorism. We have offered uh, cooperation in fighting ISIS. Unfortunately, our American partners initially uh, refused us. They actually forwarded us a written uh, statement saying they were turning down our proposal. But indeed, life goes on, and uh, very rapidly so, and very often it has, it has lessons for us to learn.
<coughs> and today, this, everybody is getting this awareness, finally, that uh, the only efficient way to uh, combat terrorism would be joint action. We have never shut, shut uh, our doors for cooperation, and we believe such collaboration could be uh, achieved not only on uh, an intergovernmental level, but also between secret services. Uh, they could uh, warn each other, they could update each other, they could give each other's uh, uh, heads up uh, warning of risks and threats. As for Syria, we need to primarily make up our minds, and our foreign ministers are now working at that, uh, which groups we believe to be terrorist organizations and which groups we could consider as parts of the Syrian in opposition, armed but rational, reasonable, and we should concentrate our efforts on fighting terrorist groups in order to provide an enabling environment for a political solution, for a political process in Syria. Vesti FM Radio, Mr. Putin, on the sidelines of the summit, you had a meeting with President Erdogan of Turkey uh, first, for the first time since uh, uh, the recent Turkish election, which uh, has influenced the political life in Turkey so much. Uh, was it? Have you found it more difficult uh, to speak to, to Turkey on issues such as uh, combating terrorism uh, during this meeting, and what will happen to the joint energy projects now? Well. No, I didn't have any trouble uh, talking to the Turkish president. Uh, I would say, on the contrary, I probably could say there's been a um, th there's been a rapprochement. Uh, our positions have uh, grown closer. The Turkish president is a very straightforward and open personnel uh, person. He's not a simple negotiator, he's not a simple counterpart in negotiation, but uh, he also obviously uh, is interested in finding a solution, and yesterday we spent a lot of time discussing both our bilateral relations and the uh, issue of Syrian, of um, uh, of a solution for Syria, and I think we have managed to um, find some common grounds um, based on which we could uh, look for a common solution. The Turkish president told me outright yesterday that he believes the, the Syrian crisis can only be resolved through political means and we need to provide an environment for a political process. As for our bi bilateral projects with Turkey, I see no problems here at all. Uh, we will continue working together uh, just the same way as we used to, as we have worked to this date. Uh, there are issues in themselves related to trade, but there are, there are always these issues issues of uh, uh, priority, what comes first, uh, uh, should um, uh, the legal, um, uh, legal work, legal procedures for the uh, South Stream come before discounts on gas prices uh, uh, or vice versa. In any case, Turkey is interested, we have been told that Turkey is interested in preserving and increasing the volume of uh, uh, sales of Russian uh, goods in the Turkish market. Of course, primarily we speak of uh, our gas contracts in the first place. Uh, we've, we've considered various uh, ways uh, and scenarios for resolving those issues where we have mutual interest. Izvestia, newspaper. I would like to go back to the issue of Ukraine, uh, especially since you had a meeting with Chancellor Merkel and uh, Germany is one of the Normandy group uh, states. Uh, do you have concerns that while the international community is focused on uh, combating terrorism, the conflict in Donbass can flare up once again? Well, we depart from uh, the premise that everybody, all the stakeholders uh, uh, involved will show enough reserve and self-restraint self uh, and we, we will not see uh, an aggravation of the situation in eastern Ukraine. Uh, on the contrary, we're hoping to see that the this ceasefire that uh, w that has taken so many efforts to actually launch, that it will not be violated, but on the contrary, it will enable further political process, a further uh, settlement. Um, 
As for our um, deliberations on the, the developments in Ukraine with my German colleague, uh, there is nothing surprising here. Uh, following the terrible uh, terrorist attacks in uh, uh, Paris and, of course, the still unclear uh, tragedy of the Russian uh, jet, uh, of course, we primarily discussed those, but the Ukrainian issue also was never off the table, was never off the agenda. Uh, I discussed those issues with all the, the counterparts with whom we had uh, bilateral meetings, uh, so this issue definitely was not off the table. Associated Press. Mr. Putin, you could often hear that your Western counterparts uh, blamed Russia, that Russian air forces were uh, were delivering airstrikes on targets in Syria that were not ISIS, that were rather moderate opposition groups. Uh, has that uh, um, has that changed in your most recent uh, meetings with them? Uh, and my second question, uh, the U.S.-led operation against ISIS has failed to destroy this terrorist group. Uh, what is the difference that you see between the uh, actions of the U.S.-led coalition and Russia's uh, air aerial operation in Syria? Your first question was whether you felt uh, a difference in attitude as regards Russia's actions in Syria from your Western counterparts. Well, this criticism uh, was almost not voiced this time around. And indeed, it would be difficult to uh, criticize Russia when people tell us, you know, you struck the wrong targets in Syria, and we tell them, well, what are the right targets? Just name them, uh, point, point us to them. If you believe uh, we, are, we are hitting the wrong targets, tell us what targets you believe are wrong. Uh, there's no feedback on either of, the, of those questions. So uh, how w should we take this kind of criticism. Now, I don't want to uh, be too sarcastic about it, but of course there are reasons for the, this kind of attitude, uh, and one of them is that uh, they are afraid to designate territories for us that we shouldn't hit because out of fear that we will deceive them all and uh, will uh, specifically deliver airstrikes on those no-go areas. Uh, I think here they judge about us based on their own ideas of decency and righteousness. But I can confirm to you that here on the battlefield, uh, uh, in the field in Syria, we have established contacts with uh, certain fractions within the, uh, the uh, armed Syrian opposition, the so-called diehard Syrian opposition, with parts of it, who have requested us not to strike uh, uh, on some of the uh, um, territories, some, some of the areas that they control. And we have delivered on uh, those uh, commitments. Um, now, part of the Syrian opposition believes it possible to start active um, military engagement against uh, some of the terrorist groups, uh, uh, primarily ISIS, uh, provided our air support. And we are ready to provide that, that air support to them. If that happens, that would mean that President Assad's uh, troops on the one hand and the Syrian opposition on the other hand are waging war on a common foe. It seems to us that would be a very helpful basis for further activities aimed at, at uh, achieving a political settlement in Syria. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, during my recent meeting in Paris within the Normandy format, that was uh, a proposal tabled by the French president, Mr. Hollande. We actually have made our first steps in this direction. They have been positive so far. We really need support from the U.S., European nations, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran in order for this process to become irreversible. And that is what we were discussing in much detail with my colleagues today. Argumenti Facti newspaper. Ever since the Russian jet over Egypt crashed, uh, it's been quite a bit of time. Uh, there are still complications uh, remaining that you've uh, spoken about, but when should we expect a, a final conclusion on the causes of that crash? And my second question is, uh, 
how great do you believe today uh, the risk of um, Russian cities suffering the same fate as Paris, uh, uh, suffering similar terrorist attacks? What is being done to prevent this kind of, of uh, attacks from happening? Unfortunately, no one is totally secured against uh, terrorist attacks in their own country. You know, France used to be considered uh, one of the uh, nations that uh, used to be uh, very hard on President Assad personally. We kept hearing it from our French counterparts that uh, Mr. Assad's resignation would have to be uh, a precondition for launching a political process in Syria. Well, has that kind of attitude secured, uh, protected uh, Paris from a terrorist attack? No. I believe that we should not put forth and press forth uh, issues that really are secondary. The first thing we need to do, primarily what, what we need to do, is uh, join forces in combating terrorist groups. And on that basis, we, we need to uh, discuss and agree on further political uh, reforms and uh, a political process. As for the crash of the Russian jet, that is a great tragedy for the entire Russian people whatever the cause of the crash. Uh, there, there were a lot of casualties, a lot of victims. This is a great tragedy. Yes, we are aware of all the hypothesis, of all the uh, scenarios. We're looking at uh, all of them, but we would be able to make a, a final uh, conclusion after all the uh, tests uh, have been accomplished. Uh, what uh, uh, tests are are we talking about? If it had been an explosion, that there must be traces uh, of, um, uh, an, of, of an explosive uh, on the parts uh, of the hull, uh, the equipment, uh, the clothes of the passengers. And we have world-class experts uh, capable of uh, tracking down uh, and detecting those uh, traces. Uh, the, only following this kind of test would it be possible to uh, speak definitively about the causes of that crash. As for whether Western nations were eff effective, efficient uh, in their activities against ISIS, uh, I think this is not the right time for us to uh, to try to evaluate and speculate who is being efficient in fighting uh, and who isn't. Uh, French jets uh, uh, have now started uh, making sorties more often than they used to, but if you compare them with the intensity of uh, Russia's air forces in Syria, you know, you would get the, the picture yourself. Uh, but uh, like I said, now is not the time to judge uh, who is doing better, who is more efficient, uh, uh, and to try to figure out why uh, the previous military action against ISIS uh, has been less than successful. Now is the time to join forces against a common foe. Thank you.